You're listening to La Hornets Arabian on Musicians and Beyond with our special Under the Cover series exploring the career of album cover designer Ernie Sheffaloo. This is part 10, the final episode. We hope you enjoy. So Ernie, you're into this space now, the CBD and and, and the marijuana industry. What's yeah. on the horizon in that for you? What What's the next big project that you get? Well, coming? you know, it's, it's great that you asked me that, Mark. Thank you. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm spending more time on my collection. Okay, I, I, I do the work that I want to do. I have these two clients. I have a couple other smaller clients. But my main project now is all this art. I have 350 original pieces and probably two or 3,000 sketches and comps and all this different printed pieces. And I want to start an online gallery. I want to start an online gallery where people can go, and we talked about this, where they can go and buy something that, you know, another competitor of theirs who also loves the group uh, would buy. And they have the only one. So, you know, it's going to start around 250 bucks and go up to 150,000. And I've got tons of stuff, every, every price point. You know, so that's a project. The other project is getting more museum shows. I've, I've, I've got one that looks really good. I've got another one that looked good before the pandemic and I'm reaching back out to them now. They're big fans and, and uh, I think that that's gonna happen. And if I can get two more museum shows, every time I get a museum show, the price of the, art, the original art goes up. Now, you know, the, it's the this problem. Is, this is an interesting topic. Uh, so. You know, when, when, when people hear about you know, a museum show, wherever it is, New York, Boston, Philadelphia, California, the artist has to put that together, the collection together, curates it obviously over a number of years, you put it together, and now you've got it all labeled and, and, and uh, organized. Yeah. How do you get it from where you are to wherever the show, let's say you're going to do a show in Boston, who yeah. pays for that shipment? How do you get it there? How does that all happen in the background? Um, it's interesting because uh, the first museum show I had was in Glendale. So I actually put the stuff in my car and drove it there <laughs> and we hung it. There were 33 pieces. Okay. And they were all, I, I had a fourplex and I had all four garages and things were under in our apartment. They were under beds, in closets. It was great. They had stuff everywhere. Nothing was really um, cataloged. So I had 33 pieces I put in this show and I was able to drive it there. Then I got, uh, a request from a gentleman uh, named Larry Tolbert in Memphis, Tennessee, who I knew through a mutual friend. And he's a huge music fan. He has an investment company, a very successful investment call, call, company called Radiant Partners. And they invest wealth. People that have money, they help them with, you know, retirement and stuff. And it's a very successful company. And he had, he's a car freak and like me. Okay. And so he reached out to me and said, look, I've got this friend. It's, it, it's a place called Art and Sound. And let me bring that up. Let me find that here. So for those listening at home, well, Ernie brings that up. You listen to Musicians and Beyond Under the Covers, uh, uh, special exclusive interviews with Ernie Sheffield. Thank you, Mark. It's great being here. You guys are awesome. And so this this guy reached out to me and said, look, I I, I – just bought a car from this guy and he's got all these muscle cars, all these classic cars that some of them are totally restored. Some of them are on the way because he had a mechanic shop, everything under all under one roof. And he said, uh, the guy is really interested in having an album cover art show to go along with his, the art of his cars. And they are, I mean, they're some beautiful cars. He had a couple hundred, man. And they were just everything from hot rods to Corvette. I mean, you name it, Lamborghinis, Ferraris. So anyway, uh, I said, well, OK, it's in Memphis, but I'm not going to put them in my car and drive them there. Uh, you're going to have to he and you are going to have to buy crates. And so I had Cooks, which is one of the top crate companies in shipping artwork for yeah. museums and stuff. Uh, they we built six crates. It cost nine thousand dollars to build six crates sure. and housed housed one hundred and twenty five pieces. And then they sent a truck to pick it all up in LA and drive it to Memphis. And that's where, that's where I had the show. Then I had a, and, and so I had the show at art and speed. And what you see behind me here is some of the cars. They built these huge panels that we hung art on in this huge space. We had big screens playing rock videos and music and 
uh, WeatherTech and a few other companies were sponsors of the show. You can see them like here uh, lined up. And and, uh, and then that's Larry and uh, some of the other people were that were there at the show. And, and so when we were hanging this show, um, the guy who was doing PR for the show uh, knew the guy, uh, John Doyle, who was the curator at the Rock and Soul Museum in Memphis. This is in Cloverdale, which is about four or five miles outside of Memphis, this art and speed facility. So he called this guy who was a curator at the Rock and Soul Museum, which is the first uh, uh, it, it's the first satellite museum that the Smithsonian created. So it's a Smithsonian museum. It's called Rock and Soul. And it's the, 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 the content in the show started in the cotton fields with blacks and blues and singing the music and stuff. And it went all the way up through, you know, rock, early rock and roll, Elvis Presley and all the Stax records and, you know, Gibson guitars and all that stuff right there in, in Memphis. And the, their, exhibit the museum ended with in like the mid mid 60s with some elvis presley memorabilia and so this guy john doyle uh the guy that was doing the pr for the show called john doyle and said hey you should come out here and see we're hanging this show in its album covers and so the, he agreed to come out and i i take it that he thought that he was going to see somebody that had taken album covers and framed them and put them up. So <clears throat> the PR guy comes back, I'm unloading crates. And he said, you know, I want you to meet this guy out here. He's the curator at the Rock and Soul Museum. I, I had never heard of it, but I knew the Smithsonian. And so I go out there and I swear to God, the guy's standing in front of the Welcome to My Nightmare painting and he's shaking, he's shaking. And his jaw is like down past his chin, you know, I mean, past his neck. I mean, he couldn't believe that this was actual art. He thought he was going to see album covers. And there's like 125 pieces of original album cover art. So he, uh, we became quick friends and he asked if I would be willing to have a show at the Rock and Soul Museum. And I said, of course, you know, no problem. So we set up a show there. The show at, uh, at Art and Speed lasted about six months. We had, um, there was probably about, 150, 120, about 1,200 people that showed up for the opening day at Art and Speed. So then we, after the six months, we, well, that show kept going. And after the first month or two, we took some of the stuff because we didn't show all 125 pieces and put it over at the Smithsonian. That show lasted um, for, it was a six, it was a one year show. It was a 12 month show. And the opening day, it got around 1,500 people, which was huge because it's a small facility. It's in the uh, uh, FedEx building there. It's like the Staples Center here in Los Angeles or in LA. That was their, you know, their, where all the basketball professional sports. And they have a section in that facility where it's the Rock and Soul Museum. And it's great because the tour buses leave people off right there in front of it. So they have a really uh, automatic audience. And so not only did we give them um, artwork to hang and then we rotated because we had so many pieces. Uh, I gave them a lot of the merchandise that I have, tapestries, posters, T-shirts, and we put it in their um, in their store. The museum had a store. And then I took a very small percentage of the sales, which turned out to be a good number. But, uh, you know, it really spiked their business like crazy because our show started in the late 60s and went all the way up into the mid 80s. So we added another two, two and a half decades worth of music history to what they already had. You know, so it was a really great, uh, a great association with them. And uh, once the show was over at Art and Speed, we, we had a couple of gallery shows as well. Uh, one gallery show there. But uh the uh, the uh, art uh, the uh, the rock and soul museum had a big storage space where we were able to store the stuff that we didn't have at the other show before then uh, after that show and and so we just kept rotating the art from there and you know it worked out really really well and what you see here let me see if I can find that piece. Now, Ernie, as you make that transition, um, so sponsorships help defer the costs. 
that 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 right yeah they had a big thing with food and everything it was amazing yeah now you're paying pr shipping setup costs all the things that go into that you you have to you know support the shows themselves you mentioned you you took a share of the profits from the sales yeah were you selling actual product or it was that part of their product that line that they had no, no. well they were selling their own stuff but okay. what we did was we added to what they already had we added posters and window clings and t-shirts and you know and and tapestries and no. uh, and did so they sold any, that stuff and I, I took a small percentage oh. i think i took like 10% and gave them 90 okay. because for me i would have given them 100 because it was the smithsonian i mean how you know museums there's a big difference between museums and galleries. Anybody can have a gallery show. All you need to do is rent a space, promote it, fill it, and now you've had a gallery show. Yeah. Museum shows are a whole different level. Okay, you have to be invited. You can't buy your way in. You can't bribe your way into a museum show. That's why it's like being commercial art and fine art. Fine art is worth a lot more than commercial art because it's selective and it, it's very prestigious and it's, it's very closed it's a closed group museums are the same way and you know we we had the uh the first museum show we had did i, I think i jumped ahead i went from uh i went from the uh, from art and speed to the smithsonian but before both of those was the a, a very prestigious museum in glendale called forest lawn okay that's the front of the building we did a six month show there. Mm -hmm. Okay, this was the first museum show I had. And um, the, the interesting thing about this place was it was in a graveyard. Forest Lawn is a very famous graveyard, <laughs> but even more famous than Forest Lawn is the museum that they have. You, you circumambulate this graveyard. It goes around and around and it gets closer and at the top, is this museum that you see here in the picture. And it looks like something out of Gothic England. I mean, it's huge. And, and so they had an album cover art show. They were having an album cover art and the curator uh, had done a show before this one with Drew Struzan, who was the illustrator that worked with us, did some of his movie posters. And so the curator asked Drew if he, they're gonna have an album cover show, would he be interested in putting some of his album cover work in there? And Drew said, well, I, you know, I don't have any. It's all owned by Ernie Shuffler. I work for his company. So she reached out to me and I, I brought over 33 pieces. That's the one I did talk about it. That's the one where I put them in my car and drove them there because yep. it wasn't that far away. So what you see here is a picture of me with the Jesus Christ Superstar and Rolling Stone song. And then the frame below that is Drew Struzan and I. That's Drew, who I've got 73 of his originals in my collection. You know, and he's the most collected illustrator in the world. He's yeah. having a show in two months at Lyon, France. Oh wow! You know, and his stuff. He's got a. He's got a. Uh, he's partners with a guy in Texas, and it's called Galactic Gallery, and they sell all his stuff. But it's not originals. Drew doesn't own his originals. They're all owned by the movie companies and Steven Spielberg and, and George Lucas mm -hmm. own all his stuff, and he has a deal with them where he can sell prints, but he has to give them a big percentage of it. Sure. So, you know, unlike me, I can sell prints. I don't have to give anybody anything, you know, which is great, except for the guy that makes the prints for me. So. Now, Ernie, uh, at, at the museum shows, you, you take some royalties or some some of the sales out of the just just to make it worth your while to go out there. Has anyone ever walked into the museum and made you an offer you couldn't refuse and you sold one of your original pieces? Yeah, no, no, they, they haven't made me, made me an offer I couldn't refuse, but I have sold pieces. I've sold about five pieces. Um, yeah, I've sold uh, Toys in the Attic. I sold Dada, the Alice Cooper album. I sold Billion Dollar Babies. I sold uh, the Inside Spread for the uh, Canned Heat album. You know, about $200,000 worth of, of art. You know, because now, because it's so rare, you know, it's become very collectible. Yeah. And, and like I said, I, I'm dealing with two of the biggest collectors in the, in the business. And, you know, we'll see where that goes. But, you know, one of them has already bought three pieces from me. So, you know, and again, at 78, that's what started me thinking about it. I mean, I'm going to, I've got no children. Who am I going to leave this to? You know I mean? So why not sell it now? Enjoy it. Let other people enjoy it too. I've had it for 50 years. Yeah, you, know, you know, why not, you know, share it with, and there's enough fans out there. I think that will help me 
you know, sell it all. Yeah, absolutely. So, and yeah. Ernie, Ernie, you um, you have a, a store also. If people go to www.pacificeyeandear.com, they right. can buy some original work. You can, uh, yeah, you can very you can, reasonable uh, price. What, what's on the site is usually prints and stuff like that. But yeah, I've had inquiries. You know, what does this cost? And then you never hear from them again when you tell them what it is, or they'll buy a poster. You know, they'll buy a print, which is great. I mean, it, it's not everybody can afford a lot of money. You know, and some of these pieces are very expensive, and <clears throat> they have the provenance to to warrant that price. Um, and the prestige of that price. So I'm not gouging anybody. It's just the reality of what it is and what it's become. But, you know, like I said, that's what started me thinking about starting more than just my e-commerce site to actually have a place where people can go and buy an original, buy an original sketch, buy a comp. <clears throat> buy, I, I went on eBay uh, not long ago and there was a, when we did the Alice Cooper Muscle of Love album, there was a, an in-store dangler that we did that was Alice going like this. And he was in a sailor costume and he, had, he looked like Popeye. He put Popeye arms on him. And uh, I saw somebody paid $300 for one and it was kind of beat up. And I'm thinking, I got three of those that are still in the bag that never went to the store. you know. And I've got all this kind of stuff like that. I've got mobiles and, and sketches and comps and stuff like that. So you know, you're a Drew Suzanne fan. Well, you can't afford one of his original pieces, but you can buy a sketch. I, you know, he they gave him when he was doing a lot of work at Universal and they started City Walk, which is all the, you know, the big thing at Universal. <clears throat> they gave him a storefront to have a show in and he put up a lot of his pieces. And what was really selling was he took a lot of his sketches and glued them to a piece of illustration board. And sold them for $250, $350. He couldn't keep the bin filled. People were just buying them like crazy. And I'm sitting, I've got probably 50 of his sketches, at least, you know, and other artist sketches and my own stuff, you know. So, I mean, why not let somebody that's a collector that can't afford $1,000 or whatever or $10,000 buy a piece that's done by the same guy that did that piece? You know, I mean, it's just as good. It's an original and you can't buy, like I said earlier, you know, there are people that collect everything that that musician has done on every format possible and all their other friends and competitors have the same stuff. Here's a chance to have something that nobody else has. And, and it's a one of a kind kind of thing. And so I think that there's, there could be a market for that. We'll see where it goes, but that's one of the things that I want to really sort of look into, you know, and, and, and all this has kind of been leading up to answer your question this is where it's going, you know, I mean, it, and I'll still take work, but it seems like the work that I really love doing more is the clients that I have and working on my collection. I mean, there's so much stuff. It took me eight months working probably three or four days a week to catalog it all. It's eight months. <clears throat> and now I have it in a space that I built. There's got to be, I don't know, three or 4,000 pieces. And I got it all cataloged. The other day I had to go get something and I looked in my cataloging thing online and found it, knew right where it was and went right to it, right to the folder in the area that it was. I mean, it's pretty neat. I've never had that ability before. If somebody wanted something, I had to start at one end and go toward the other end and somewhere in between. It was usually at the end that you'd find it, you know. So then I even started working at the end first. And that didn't work either because it would be at the other end so or halfway there. So you know, cataloging, it was really the real, the right thing to do. So, you know, it's, it's been very interesting and I'm enjoying, I find myself enjoying it more and more. The work that I do becomes very fast. What used to take me hours takes minutes. And I don't know how else to explain that. I guess it's because I'm getting older. So like you said, Mark, there's a lot of experience that goes into what I do. And there aren't that many different problems. There really isn't. I mean, and I, I've, I've always fashioned or thought of myself as a solution provider that's looking for the problem. I've already got the solution. I just need the problem, yeah. you know, where some people have the problem and need the solution. I'm sort of asked backwards. So it's, you know, but it works. It works that way. And, and I, again, like I said, I'm finding it. And the other thing that goes into the mix is my own personal time. I never had a minute that wasn't for sale. Now there's hours and sometimes days that aren't for sale. 
Even if somebody wants to buy them, I, I just won't do it. I don't feel like doing it. I don't have to do it. And I'd rather go out into my 20 by 30 space and, you know, look at my stuff. And now my Corvette's back. I have a 67 Corvette that I totally redid. And it's just a killer. Put a big block Dynatech motor in it. I mean, it's awesome. And I have a 40 Ford pickup truck that I did too. So those two things, my life with my wife and our life here in the desert in our bubble is awesome. Yeah. You can't put a price on that. That's for sure. You cannot. You cannot. You know, I, and my, when I had bladder cancer and I, and I, my surgeon who was the top surgeon at Cedar sinai for urology, I got bladder cancer from stress and I caught it early. This was 23 years ago. And he said, you know, the one thing that I've never, ever heard anybody say is that I should have worked harder. You know, it's more about, I should have lived life because it, you know, they say, you know, you know, you only live once. That's not true. You, you die once. You live every day. Yeah. And I've learned to live every day. And, and, and luckily, as I've moved along in my career, I'm starting, like I said earlier, it's like Frank Sinatra. I did it my way. And I'm still doing it my way. I take what I want, what intrigues me. And if not, I have a life. Yeah. And I have a collection. And I have these cars. And life is wonderful. And, you know, Ernie, I, you make a very, very good point. You know, 78 years seems like a long time when you think about it in, in, in certain ways, but it goes by so goddamn fast, doesn't it? It does. It does. I Every, can't believe it. Yeah. Sometimes I feel like I'm 25 or 30. I have to think about it. Somebody will say, how old are you? I said, 58. Oh, no, wait, no. <laughs> yeah. oh, 70. Now it's like, like I said, I got more behind me than I have in front of me. So that's a real eye opener. Yeah, real, I take it know. as a compliment when my wife tells me you act like you're 21 years old. Thank yeah, that's, that's, that's good. Yeah, my wife tells me that too. When are you gonna When are you gonna grow up? What are you gonna be when you grow up? Not a chance. I, I'll, I'll think about it when I grow up. Right now, I'm not ready to think about it. I'm it, having too much fun. And you your know? wife Barney has been by your side for years. Yes, we've been together since 19. Well, we've been together 57 years. She supported you. She's you know been yeah. your biggest fan. Andy. Yeah, and my harshest critic. Yeah. And without her, we had talked about this in other shows, without her, I would have never done anything that I've done. <laughs> it would have all ended back in 1969 when I went to New York and was ready to turn around and come back. It would have never happened. None of this. And that's a mind blower, too. When you think about it, all this stuff that I've done, and it, none of it would have ever been done. It would have been something else. It would have been a whole different thing. I mean, you know, and, and I had never really been out of California, but something said, hey, you know, if you want to be good, if you want to be good at what you do, that's where you need to go. You've got to go there. You can't. And I was very comfortable in Oakland and the freelancing and agencies in San Francisco and stuff. I knew I could get a full time job there, but it wouldn't have been the opportunities weren't there. They just weren't. You've got to go where the opportunity is. And I and, I, and at 24, that's what I did. And by tw by at 24 by 26 and a half, I owned my own company, you know, and was in off to the races, you know, the, the rocket, you know, the first stage of album covers and, and stuff like that, a bit of corporate America, but mainly album covers was really the, the rocket that, that got us off the ground, you yeah. know, and then I wanted to just talk about one more thing here, which is, oh, well, here's the, uh, here's the Seoul Museum stuff. The, uh, that one. This, is the out, this is the outside of their museum. These are the people that are uh, on the board there. And the guy on the far right is Larry Tolbert, who brought me to Memphis in the first place. And what you're seeing here is we went there. We got this man. This newspaper you see is the biggest newspaper in Memphis. And they gave us a four page spread with the show coming to the Smithsonian. And what you see over here is one of the rooms that we had two big rooms. This was one of them you see there. And what you see is some of the stuff hanging on the walls. And what we did was in the middle of the room, we put a big anvil case that musicians ship their equipment in technical. So you guys know anvil cases. We did all there. I did all their branding and stuff from the beginning, but we put a big anvil case there. And on the case, we put the album covers for the art that was hanging on the walls. So people could go in, pick up the album cover and walk over to the artwork 
you know, here you're looking at a 12 and 3 eighths by 12 and 3 eighths album cover, and then you look at the art, and it's 30 by 40. And it's like, oh, my God, I'm so used to seeing it this big, and now it's gigantic, you know? So that was really that. And I, I, a lot of times I would just go and hang out. I would hang out at the Forest Lawn. I would hang out at the Smithsonian when I, I spent two or three weeks in Memphis, you know, launching the show and then being there to meet people and stuff and, and sign stuff and sell and sell stuff. And uh, but I sometimes I would just be a fly on the wall. I'd go there and hang out, and see how people reacted to the stuff. And it was amazing. And like I said, when we did the Rock and Soul, it's a small museum. Opening day, we had 1500 people. And, you know, and John told me that, you know, one of the things that the issues that they had was they had been there so long that people would go once, maybe twice, mm -hmm. but that was about it. And then because the show really didn't change, it was what it was. And they'd have, you know, a photography show here and there of Elvis Presley or something, and they'd get a small uh, uh, people. And, and they had a lot of tourists because, like I said, the tour buses would leave them right outside the the uh, stadium there where they were in the uh, they had a facility there and uh when we started the show they saw a huge spike in residents that would come back just to see the show and then they'd come back again and bring somebody so we really sort of documented all that stuff you know to see what the response was from people and it was really kind of it was really kind of neat and you neat. know i mean again um these museum shows were really i mean aside from the prestige and the provenance you get from it, it was great learning for me to see how people reacted when they saw this. Cause it's rare. You don't, you see a lot of rock and roll photography shows, a lot of them mm -hmm. album cover art shows. Not so much. It's like finding a chicken's tooth. Yeah. I imagine yeah. when, when you're sitting there and you, you, you're looking at the 12 by 12 and then you see it up, it gives you such a different perspective. There's depth, there's spatial issues that, that the change sort of, you know, yeah, it, things sure. face differently. So I, I, I would imagine that's going to be really cool to watch someone. Yeah, and people would go, a lot of people would say, well, how come it's so big, you know, and the album cover is so small? Well, because when you do it big and you reduce it down, it gets tighter. Yeah. yeah. It gets better, you know, so we would do everything bigger, you know, and that really blows people's minds. Like you I'm said, sure. Mark, yeah. it's true. They would just, oh, my God, here's this thing that's this big, and now it's so big that it's, it's mouth, especially the Black Sabbath pieces. They're 30 by 40 horizontal. And they're colored pencil and acrylic. And it's just colored pencil is one of the hardest mediums to work in because of the paraffin base to it mm -hmm. and, and how it responds to the, where you're, what you're putting it on it. And so, and Drew was a master at colored pencil, you know, and we were all learning together. It was really kind of interesting mm -hmm. how all that happened. And then the last thing that we're going to talk about on this segment well, actually, we're doing okay, huh? Have we over? We haven't run out oh, of time. We, for we are doing good. Oh, okay, good. Well, yeah, doing uh, good. Then one of the other things I wanted to talk about is the Goldmine Magazine piece that we right. did, and, and that's working out pretty amazing. Yeah, what um, an article that was. Yeah, yeah, it was twenty pages, but now it's online. I'll send you guys the links. What they did was, <clears throat> Ivor had written the story. It was thirty pages. And they didn't, they don't even give the Rolling Stones 20 pages in their magazine. Okay, nobody. Got, and, and so for the first time, they gave me a 20 page article in their magazine and they do different covers. They do four different covers for every issue. They'll put the same insides and a different cover. And some of them go to the newsstand. Some of them are subscription based. Some of them are buy online. So what they did was they gave me two of the four covers. And what you see over here is where David Bowie is and the Ramones. And then you see my cover. This is the first time they ever did a graphic for a magazine cover. And they've been around for a long time. Goldmine is the Bible. Yeah. yeah. And this is the first time they've ever done a graphic cover. And that's the logo we did for Liquor Pizza, which was a chain of record stores here in Los Angeles. And the interesting thing about this is that the, th the covers that I'm not on, the one with David Bowie and the one with the Ramones, you, you can't see it here, but above the logo for Goldmine, it'll say the Beach Boys, the Ramones, and Ernie Shuffler. So I'm topping the bill for David Bowie, and I'm topping the bill for the for the Ramones on their covers. And then on my Goldmine cover above that is 
the Beach Boys, David Bowie, the Ramones. So they were really cool about that. And then the other thing that they gave me was this cover that you see coming out of the slipcase with all those different covers on it. That was a special cover that only went in the slipcase. And yeah. they used the Licorice Pizza logo on the slipcase of the, the magazine. And this is a different cover than the other three. So they gave me two of the four covers. They've never done a cover like the graphic on this one. And they've never done a cover where they showed that many album covers or album covers, period. It's always just like you see David Bowie or you see the Ramones or, you know, U2 or whoever it is, the Rolling Stones. They don't really do multiple things and graphic things on their covers. And these worked out really, really well. They sold out of, oh, this slipcase, this particular slipcase cover, the one you see below, let me get out of the way here. This one on the bottom comes with 10 prints. So they had me make 10, eight by 10 print. They had me make 20 each of 10. So there were a total of 200 individual prints uh, that I numbered and signed and stamped with a Pacific Ioneer corporate stamp. So they offered in this particular slip case, you could either buy one print for, I think it was $29, or you could buy all 10 prints for $126 or something. They sold out. They sold out. And, and I was one of those consumers. Yeah, yeah. I have a few myself. I ended up buying them too. So I, <laughs> they, and they sent me a few. So, and, and then, I, Ivor yeah. Levine, who you referred to before, that's yeah. the author of the article. And he yeah. did an incredible job basically breaking down your, you know, 50 plus years in the music industry. Yeah, I met him. I met him. The first time I met Ivor was at the Glendale Forest Lawn Museum. He was a writer for L.A. Beat Magazine, and he uh, had had gone to the show to write about the show, this album cover art show at, the, at Forest Lawn. And he had the curator introduce me to him and we became really good friends. And he'd come over to the house and we'd talk. And, and we I actually did a. Uh, a Saturday night show with Burton Cummings online. And sometimes it would go three and four hours and Ivor would come over and hang out. And then he was part of the show as well. And Burton and I and him, and, and that was really great. And then, um, you know, he, he started writing exclusively as a contributing editor to Goldmine. And, um, and I didn't know this, but he was putting together a, a proposal to Goldmine magazine to do an article on me. And they had never really done anything like that. It's always been about musicians. Yeah. You know, it's always been about groups and stuff. It's never really been about a graphic artist. They may have had an article in this, the magazine, but never giving them what they gave me. And it's funny because uh, before we, Ivor had finished the article, and I think I might have mentioned this to you. He had finished the article, submitted it, and the editor said, um, well, the first thing he said was, you know, I'm thinking about pulling this because it looks like you and Ernie are plotting to get even with Craig Braun, who was the guy that I worked for when I did the Rolling Stones and Alice Cooper and Chicha Chong. And he took credit for all of that. So it looks like you're taking credit or you're trying to, you know, you're trying to get back at him. And Ivor stood up and said, at him and said, no, he said, I'm telling this guy's story and this is the truth. And this is how it really happened. And I had interviewed Craig. He interviewed Craig. There's a very nasty post that Craig had done in all caps about how I was this raving lunatic drug addict that had nothing to do with anything, you know? <laughs> and so we and he printed it in all caps. So we took that and we, we were going to put it in the, in the book that we're doing, <laughs> but we decided to put it in this magazine article. So in the article is Craig's response about how I had nothing to do with anything. I thought it was great, you know, because not long after I left him, he became, uh, he became, uh, uh, partners with a guy named Tom Wilkes, who was the creative director at AM Records. And before that, he worked at Camouflage Productions, which was an album cover design company. They did the Pearl album for Janet Joplin and some other albums, George Carlin, Class Clown. And they all looked the same. They all had a blue backdrop with the artist. And, and so, but, but Tom had gone to work with Craig because Craig needed to, there was a lot of animosity between East Coast and West Coast. And East Coast was moving out to the West Coast. West Coast people didn't like it. City mouse, country mouse. 
right. and you know the people from New York were city slickers. California was more easygoing, you know, and laid back, and, and so there was a lot of animosity. And Craig needed to have that, you know, that California presence, which I brought because I grew up in California, and I hadn't didn't have an, a, a New York accent and stuff. So I was a perfect guy to send out here to start that art department. And and so you know when we we split, his vice president and I, and his head of production, started to the guy in here. He became partners with Tom Wilkes and. They did the Tom did the Tommy album with the big ball bearing on the front. I mean, a beautiful cover and a, a booklet inside. But then, not long after that, while he was working on it, they had a falling out, and Tom left. And Craig was pretty much out of business. Not not long after that, Pacific Ironier kept going for another fourteen years, fourteen and a half years. So, you, yeah, you must have been really offended. Okay, drugs. Well, maybe Raven Looney Tech. Yes, but not part of anything. That yeah. must have been really. <laughs> It was, it was, it was, uh, I knew that it was going to happen because that's how he was. Right. He wasn't about to give me any credit for anything. You know, I've now become the enemy and, you know, that's fine. I hated him for a lot of years. Then I learned how to, and the cool thing about it was I learned how to take that hatred and turn it into creative fuel. Okay. That's that, that, in a, you know, I, I hate to admit that I actually hated anybody because I don't really hate people anymore. But you grow out of that, and I and I, but I was able to convert that hate into fuel, and that fueled the creative engine. And it was like every cover I did was just like a a voodoo doll sticking another pin in it, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, it takes too and, much energy not to like someone. Yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, it really was, and 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 you know, I, I knew that I was going to have to walk away from that. It was a hard thing to do because I could have stayed. I could have stayed. And I could have put up with what we were putting up with, but my partner, who was his vice president, wasn't going to stay. His head of production didn't want to stay. And, you know, I was ready to go to work for his competitor, a company called AGI. It was moving out to the West Coast from Chicago. They were a printer. They were trying to get in on the board printing that album covers had moved to. And so they actually started a satellite office in Los Angeles and wined and dined me for uh, quite a while to go to work for them. And I think I might have told you that story. The guy that did I tell you that story about Dick Block, the guy who was yep. you know, yeah. yeah, and getting even with him, ordering meals <laughs> to go and stuff. It was great. And then saying now we're even, you know. So, but you know, uh, it was interesting. But the, you know, back to the Goldmine magazine. You know, the first one with the ten uh, different prints sold out right away, and so they came back to me about uh, a month later and said, "Hey, let's do a second release we'll have five five more so that's what you see in the upper part here is the five additional prints that came with that particular cover they didn't sell them individually they sold them only as the group i think it was like 76 dollars and they're moving too so you know what ended up happening uh is i became really good friends with the editor and their head of sales and they're now talking about giving me a uh, space on their website to sell prints they want to go into business with me selling my prints and which is great because they not only own gold mine, they own 13 music publications, mm -hmm. they own revolver, they own heavy metal, they own, you know, this one, they own a whole bunch of them. So they're talking about exposure in all those magazines for my prints. And it's, it's great. It's a great reach for me. You know, I've got the content, which today content is King and they've got the reach. So it's a great partnership, you know, and I'm very excited about that, you know, and, and uh, they're great people. They're really, really nice people. The editor and the head of sales, really, really genuine, honest to goodness people, which is hard to find these days. But, mm -hmm. you know, I've been very, I've been very, very lucky. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. that's that's kind of pretty much, you know, this part of what we were talking about, um, you know, looking back on on the career like we talked about. You know, and then looking forward to it, it's it's been a great career. It's not anywhere near over. And I so. understand they're taking bits and pieces of your life and you are going to put it together in a book. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're working on a book. And one of the things that we're talking with you guys about is a tabletop coffee table book. I'm um, about 125 pages into it. And what we're talking about is something that could very easily adapt over. And you guys have the right idea of number of pages because I don't want it to just be an album cover book. There's a lot of album cover books out there. There's probably got to be three dozen. And I'm in a couple, a few of them. But, you know, there's more that I'm not. And it's just those companies, even like um, 
you know, uh, what do you call it? hypnosis in England. Yep. Very big, well-known cover, Dark Side of the Moon, Storm Thurgeson and all these guys. And, you know, but that's all they did. They did album covers, you know, and Pacific Ioneer did album covers, but we also did corporate work. And we talked about this. I just don't want to get pigeonholed. Mm-hmm. I don't want to just do one thing. And, and again, that variety is also fuel for creativity. You know, if you sit there doing, you know, putting door handles on pickup trucks all day long, it's not very creative. It gets pretty boring after a while. But to have that variety, to be able to switch from one thing to another and apply what you learn from the piece that you just completed and apply it to the next piece that you do, even if it's from a conceptual standpoint of how to think outside the box, be disruptive. That's one of the things that, you know, back in the day, they used to call it out of the box. You know, uh, today they call it disruptive. Mm-hmm. So I'm here, and I guess my career has always been more of this disruptive, out of the box kind of thinking. And some people dig it, some people get scared of it. You know, I've had I've had clients say, "Okay, we want something really, we want out of the box, man. We want," it. and then you show it to them, and they're like, "Ah, what happened? Get out of there! Go back! Go back!" You know, <laughs> you, you, you got to drag them back. You know, this was this was a company. This was a gallery called Disciple Gallery. It's a very small gallery, and it's in that building, <laughs> that vertical building uh, in Memphis. And this guy who owns Disciple Gallery is a uh, creative guy. He has an agency on the top floor. He owns the building, and he turned the bottom floor into a gallery. And so he's friends with Radiant Partners. And uh, when, when he went to the show at Art and Speed, and he went to the show at, uh, the, the, uh, at the Smithsonian Rock and Soul, he approached me and asked if I would have a show at his gallery. And it's just a, a small space. And there you see the different people looking at the stuff. That was, it was, uh, it was probably, uh, and there's the crates. There's the crates that you asked me how we ship them. Oh, yeah. There's yeah. Six, six, there's five crates and then those uh, anvil cases there that have all the artwork, 125 pieces, these five crates and those, those boxes a whole. And uh, so we had we had a show at his gallery, small gallery, and we had 360 people show up. There were people outside waiting to come in when people left. It was, you know, so that was a pretty good show. And that that lasted, I think, uh, if I remember, four weeks. So, you know, I've had the gallery shows. I've had the museum shows. It's really it's very exciting for me to be able to show this stuff. You know, because a lot of it is, you know, like I said, you don't think about it when you're doing it. You don't think about how it's it's music history and stuff. It's just, you know, it was a project. I love doing it, but this stuff has become iconic. A lot of it, you know, and even the most obscure groups, there are fans out there that love these groups, you know. So, um, you know, it, it, for me, it's it's been a real um, it's been a real experience, you know, and, I, and I've, I've loved every minute. Of it. <laughs> well, will you? keep the uh the history going and yeah. getting this out to our listeners and yeah. again well, check- i appreciate everything you guys have done i really do you know and i'm glad it's working for you as well oh my god yeah and, and i have to tell you today's episode um one of my favorites uh i think there's a lot of content here for the audience and and i really enjoyed learning what i've learned today and uh i love listening to you uh, <laughs> like we've said, no, no one wants to hear the two of us, but your story and the story of the musicians, that's what really makes this a, a compelling show and an interesting show. Not us two, that's for sure. Well, no, you guys do a great job, too. You ask the right questions and you you let me talk, you know, because, <laughs> you, you know, I mean, I, I, and, and it's great. I, I not that I'm, you know, egotistical or anything, but I love to get the story out there because once I'm gone, the stories go with me, you know, and then I don't, I don't want that to happen. I want it to be out there. I want people to know. And, and I, and I get that a lot, like, God, I never knew that. That was what, and thank you so much for sharing that, you know? So, I mean, there is an audience that wants to know. Oh, absolutely. That's why I think it's going to be important to get this documentary, you know, if it's done the proper way, get it out there for the world to see. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and thank you guys again for, you know, for that. I mean, it's, it's our pleasure. Been, yeah. It's, it's our pleasure. It's been awesome. All right. Look forward to more. We have been listening to Musicians and Beyond's final episode of the special series Under the Covers, part 10, where we have explored the life and career of iconic album cover designer Ernie Sheffaloo. 
We hope you have enjoyed the show.